It's my huge pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Wang Wei. Uh, Professor Wang Wei has been to Miser before and uh, at least to our uh, final year students, uh, he, is, he is known uh, to those who've come into Miser over the last couple of years. Uh, it's a privilege to, to hear you, Professor Wang Wei. Um, Professor Wang Wei is a distinguished professor of humanities um, in the, and, and the director of uh, Tsinghua Institute for Advanced Study in Humanities and Social Sciences at uh, Tsinghua University, Xinhua University, excuse me, um, Beijing. Um, now this, we read one part of a two-part article, at least the students did. I, I, I had the chance to read both of them. Uh, maybe some of you read both of them. But of course, these serve as introductions uh, to a three-volume um, treatise uh, on China in the 20th century, uh, which uh, we hope to make available uh, at least to our students in Kampala as soon as, as, soon as that is possible. Um, so Professor Wangwe, our procedure is uh, basically you have uh, up to an hour uh, to, <clears throat> uh, to speak to us, to give you a talk. Uh, after that, there will be uh, uh, two discussants uh, who will have uh, roughly 10 to 12 minutes each. Uh, <laughs> the first discussant will be uh, Dr. Ede Bangerezako. Ede is a, a postdoctoral fellow at Miser. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, and I've taken advantage of being chair to appoint myself the second discussant. Yeah, okay. uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't resist the temptation to, uh, to engage with this. Um, and uh, and then you get to respond to the discussants, uh, okay. and after that we open up the discussion mm -hmm. uh, to rounds of uh, questions or comments. In each round, we we'll take uh, uh, three three comments or questions, and then you respond, and then okay. another round. Um, the limit is three hours. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, thank you. Right. Yeah. So my part is about uh, 40 minutes or the one hour or something like that. You decide. You decide. Okay. Up to one hour. Up to one hour. Up to, yes, up to. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. It's uh, amazing that uh, we did. We have no such experience to have an online lecture from such. I thought that uh, uh, I still remember vividly my visit to Kampala. That's really great. And uh, I really enjoyed the communication and, and the discussion at that time. I really, it's the first experience in Africa that was to Kampala. Okay, um, I actually just received the copy, uh, the volume one of my book in Chinese today, uh, yesterday, actually, the search show that the, the f uh, first volume, I, I don't know whether or not you can see it. Maybe. Yes. Yeah, you can see it. Uh, these are, so the, what you read is the long introduction in the volume one. <laughs> so that's the, uh, um, um, I, I can uh, use my PPT maybe. Uh, you prefer to read PPT or uh, I share PPT or I just a talk. What, what kind of, what's the better? Uh, I think the talk would be better. Okay, okay, that's okay. great. So yeah. I will talk on the, uh, the so-called the birth of the century, uh, means that the, the 20th century, imperialism, mm -hmm. nationalism, or the cosmopolitanism in the early 20th century. That's the beginning, the first part of the book. I try to uh, talk about four issues. The first is how to define the 20th century in China. The second is imperialism. Uh, 
and the theorization of the 20th century. The part three is the creation of the preceding history of 20th century and the contemporary correlation. And uh, part four, the singular and the universal, the four dimensions of idea of the century. So the first part, now I talk about the first question, how to define the 20th century in China. So uh, basically when I, uh, when I was young, uh, uh, during the Cultural Revolution, uh, we were told that we are living in the age that defines self as different from all other past periods, all. So this is a very different age. But after the 1989, or even earlier, maybe the, from the beginning of the 1980s, a lot of the new ideas, reflections on the 20th century emerged. I give you the three examples one example uh, is very famous slogan uh, in China, that is the farewell to revolution, raised by Professor Li Zhehou and Professor Liu Zaifu. Uh, both are very active, famous intellectual in the 1980s in China. Now, both of them, after 1989, exile in America. So the farewell to revolution you can see as a, another kind of the echo, uh, echoes of the thesis of the end of the history from my point of view. So that's the, the very negative or the critical reflection on the 20th century. The second slogan raised by the French radical philosopher Alain Badiou, he called himself a post Maoist philosopher. In his book, the entitled The Century, he cited that one sentence that this century already existed. And obviously, this century already existed, meaning that uh, he belongs to that century. And no matter you criticize it, that century already existed. It's a provocative uh, the slogan and uh, belong to maybe 1968 generation. They are show their loyalty or the fidelity to that century, the idea of the 1968 and a whole revolution maybe in the 20th century. But in the field of Chinese studies, the, since the 1980s up to now, the mainstream of historiography, I think, is so-called a tend to local history. That basically they argue, you know, that in, in America, a lot of scholars challenge the paradigm raised by Fairbank, that so-called Western challenge the Chinese response. And uh, they argue that the formation of modern state in China we need to understand it as a so-called Chinese process, a process determined by its internal historical development. Means that not simply as a response to Western challenge, but you can find a lot of elements from Chinese history itself. So they turn to the local history to explain the 20th century as a continuation to, in a way, a continuation of the long history. So in that sense, how to define the position of 20th century in the history of China has become a question, still a big question. So uh, we, uh, before we answer this question, maybe we need to think about, before we th uh, talk about 20th century, we need to think about the idea of the 19th century. So the idea of the 19th century in world history uh, actually has been crucial to define the different periodizations in the global history. Uh, here I give you the 
three examples. Uh, the, one of the most famous may be the Eric Hobsbawm trilogy, the long 19th century. Basically, it, the three volumes entitled The Age of Revolution, The Age of Capital, The Age of Empire, generally started from, from French Revolution down to the beginning of the World War I. That means that the beginning of the World War I was the beginning of the 20th century. That's the short 20th century. Some other scholars, historians like Christopher Bailey, The Birth of the Modern World, integrated the other part of South Asia and other part of uh, the areas into the narrative of 19th century. But the paradigmation is very much the same, 1780s to 1914. And the recent book was the Jürgen Osterheimer's The Transformation of the World, A Global History of 19th Century. That uh, for him, it's, uh, there was a, in, in Financial Times, there was a book review, which uh, it, it said, I quote here, the 19th century, Osterheimer insists, was above all a time when unprecedented amounts of knowledge were accumulated and displayed in archives, libraries, museums, exhibitions, and encyclopedias. When the world was measured and mapped with a new precision, when its inhabitants were counted and classified and depicted in novel way, and when information could be globally transmitted more rapidly than ever, so that the, the order was David Canada. He's obviously the, the Alzheimer's, uh, the, the focus is shifted to the culture, technology, and so on and so forth, di different from the uh, political history. But in any case, the periodization of the, uh, uh, the 19th century uh, are the same from the uh, uh, 1780 down to the 1914. So for the Hobsbawm, the definition of short 20th century, it's really from a European position. Uh, it's really started from the beginning of World War I to the end of the Cold War. So that's contrast with the 19th century, the age of revolution he labeled that 19th century as the age of revolution, which imply he used that the short 20th century as a century, the age of extreme, implying the 20th century was filled with violence and didn't leave as much legacy like the French Revolution and the British Industrial Revolution did. So here, the, my question is, that maybe in Africa, we can also raise the same question. Is there a so-called 19th century in Chinese history? So it's uh, the, the, because the, the, the category or the concept of the century is only emerged at the beginning of 20th century. Before that, we have no such terms at all. i give you some examples. The, uh, the, in the late 19th century, there was a lot of this, uh, the, 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 the reformers, revolutionaries, intellectuals, they tried to invent some new calendars. Like uh, Kang Youwei, he was the reformer, a, a very important figure in 1898 reform. He put forward in, uh, in 1895, uh, he put forward a chronology starting from the Confucius uh, in, in the launch issue of a newspaper, Chang, Chang Zhe, uh, Chang Zhe Bo, in 1895, promoting, which it's a promoting reformation in Shanghai. Kang Ye, we refer to the contemporary Qin imperial reign of Guangxu Emperor by chronology of Confucius. He said that the, that was the year of 2,373 years after Confucius' death. So that's the, the issue of the Confucius calendar. And the, in the 1903, the, there were some revolutionaries that they also put forward a new calendar, which used the Emperor Huangdi chronology. That was first proposed 
by reformist and uh, revolution anarchist Liu Shipei uh, in 1903. And the year of 1905 was calculated and defined by another revolutionary, Song Jiaoren, who was later, uh, after the 1911 revolution, he was the pri pioneer, uh, a pioneer and a leading member of Chinese United League at that time. He said that as the 4,603 uh, and three years after the instrument of Emperor Huangdi and the ancestor of the Han Chinese, and since then, Ming Bao, that the, the official journal of United League, started to use the Emperor Huangdi's chronology. So at that time, no such idea of the 19th century, 20th century at all. The Christian uh, cr uh, chronology, uh, it's, it's only emerged at the beginning of the 20th century. It's a very alien idea of the century, as well as the Gregorian calendars emerged at that time. So in, in this sense, the so-called 19th century, 18th century, or 17th century, and their sequence could be thought as uh, derivatives of the 20th century. It's 20th century not developed from that sequence, but a rather early period was the uh, creation by the 20th century. So the notion of the century closely connected with the 20th century, which have a double meanings. The first of all, 20th century is a, is a temporal demarcation, meaning that the, it's a very different period from all fifth past his past period. The second, they, they invented the, this new idea for understanding of the singular propensity of the time, which rendered the history of others into the, a history of one's own, means that the 20th century is not only for Chinese, but also for the global history. And now we integrate it into the global history. At the same time, we integrate others' history into our own history. So while you're situating it within history in total for explanation, and identification. So these, I think, it's uh, the idea of the century itself shows the birth of global synchronicity in the history of China. So that's very different from any other kind of concept of time before. So the, in that sense, China's 20th century as a actually is uh, the first of all for, for, for me is still not only of a lot of the tragedies extremes happened in that century but at the same time that is still the age of the revolution so the 1911 chinese revolution uh, for me is the most one of the most significant events among the chain of events that marked the awakening of Asia in the beginning of the 20th century. The first revolution in the 20th century was the Russian Revolution of 1905, triggered by the Russian-Japanese War, which happened in Northeast China. So second, you can see the Iranian Constitutional Revolution of the 1905 to 1907, Turkish Revolution of 1908 to 1909, Chinese Revolution 1911 and the Russian Revolution of 1917. So in that sense, the Russian Revolution, October Revolution or the February Revolution was a response to the war in Europe. But if you put it into the chain of the series of events or the revolutions in Asia, you can also say that some aspects or the response to that the Asian history. So it, on the one hand, it's a part of the European event, but on the other hand, it is a sequence of the Asian revolutions. And the Cultural Revolution in 1966 up to the 1976, as maybe the last revolution in the 20th century that the many scholars like uh, Alain Badiou or the Mac Farquhar and they all use the term of last revolution 
to define the Cultural Revolution. Whether maybe some people will raise the issue of Iranian Revolution and so on and so forth, whether or not that's still part of the 20th century revolution, that's the big question. But in any case, still, I think that the China's 20th century is the age of the revolution. A lot of the things happened. Without that revolution, the revolutionary age is difficult to understand contemporary China. So that's the, the first uh, the part one, my first how to define the 20th century, why the, the, the idea of the century became a question. That now I will uh, move to the part two, the imperialism and the theorization of the 20th century. So uh, as, as I try to find the, uh, the examples in the historical documents, the one of the earliest use of employment of the concept of, of the 20th century uh, was by in, in a long poem uh, by very famous, maybe one of the most famous Chinese intellectuals in the first decades of the 20th century, Liang Qichao. He was also the Kang Youwei's student and uh, activist and the participants in, in the 1898 reform. After the failure of that reform, he exiled in Japan. And then he tried to, he admired America. And at the same time, he had a communication with the Sun Yat-sen, the first, later became the first president of the, uh, uh, the, the, the Republic of China. In, after the 1911 revolution. He, Liang Qichao belonged to the reformer uh, camp, not revolutionary camp, but after the failure of the 1898 in exile in Japan, he contacted, to get, he communicated with Sun Yat-sen. He decided to go to America at the invitation of Sun Yat-sen. And but the first stop was in Hawaii, in Honolulu. But when he arrived in Honolulu, he was stopped by Kang Youwei because Kang Youwei heard that Liang Qichao already arrived in Honolulu and was in, in, the, in contact with the Sun Yat-sen. He stopped him uh, to, uh, uh, to go to America to meet the Sun Yat-sen. But in, in that year, the 19, in January 30, 1900, he was in Honolulu wrote a long poem, which in tie to the song of 20th century Pacific Ocean. That's quite an interesting long poem. It's a historical, uh, the poem. First, it's a song, it's a poem, but the word concept of 20th century image, he didn't use any other, uh, the old traditional uh, concepts of the paradization or the cleaners, but he used employed the 20th century to describe the singularity, that the moment of the 20th century. The second, he combined the 20th century together with the Pacific Ocean. We know that uh, later, a lot of the historian like uh, 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 Emmanuel Wollaston or Arigi, and uh, those people to describe the, the 20th century as a Pacific or the, the shift of the center of capitalism from Atlantic to the Pacific. And here, the Liang Qichao in 1900, the January, he combined the 20th century together with the Pacific Ocean as the new characteristic of the new age. It's interesting, he tried to combine in that long poem to combine the Gongyang, the Confucius theory of three ages and the European idea of the history of civilizations. He divided the whole history into the three ages. One, the age one is the age of rivers, early China, India, Egypt, and Asia Minor, which according to Confucius' uh, the idea of the early history, 
is the age of chaos, is the full of the chaos, violence, and so on and so forth. The second age was the age of continental sea, the Mediterranean Sea, Baltic Sea, Arabic Sea, the Yellow Sea, as well as uh, Bohai, the Bo Sea. The second age, according to the Confucian calendar, was the age of peace. The last one is the age of great ocean after Columbus. It is according to the Western narrative, the time of so-called, he used that the term, he just uh, defined the age of great ocean after Columbus as the time of so-called national imperialism. The first, he used the term of national imperialism. So the 20th century Pacific Ocean national imperialism together was the three crucial characteristic of the 20th century. But according to the narrative of Confucian Gongyang theory, the last stage will be the age of great unity or the great harmony. However, Liang Jiuzhou said that, uh, no, he didn't define it. He used early to, he used the Confucian concept to equal to the two ages. But the last age, he didn't employ any Confucian concept to define it. Partly because he said that, uh, no, it's not the 20th century is not the great unity or the great harmony, but the great danger, great challenge, and a great crisis never happened before. So he used that. So is that really the, 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 the understanding of the time for that? So, but in any case, next year, he eventually visit mainland America. He visits, he traveled, he especially trying to observe the American capitalism to think about the, the role of China or the position of China in the 20th century. In, from 1902 to 1903, he published a very long essay. It's in tie to the monster of the 20th century, trust. He tried to use the, the trust historically mono, monopolies or the near monopolies in the US during the second industrial revolution as a form of the trust. He said that that was the, the, the in organization of industry. The trust can be used to define the nature of the monster of the 20th century. For him, the rise of trust was meant to redeem the evil of surplus production. Trust became increasingly intricate in organization and increasingly appropriate in management, which increased among the property in the US by several times. The American trust was the consequence of the excess productivity and in American imperialism, the consequence of the excess capital since the establishment of trusts, both ineffective as remedies. So here he said that the, then he, I quote here, he said that the imperialism is to sack other countries and reside in other societies with a military force in order to expand one's influence and the territory. Those countries declaring to be powerful in the contemporary world follow this is with no exception. Their power of expansion has gradually moved beyond the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the Indian Ocean, re reaching our country, but still not stopping. People of our country were either welcome and use it or be conquered and destroyed. But he, he, he signed the Kotokoshusi was a Japanese thinkers, the first book on the imperialism, call it a monster. Hence, you could imagine the innovativeness, precision, and the insight of his arguments before starting reading it. We translated the parts of it for your reference so that you could reach a just of the, reflect, uh, the uh, reflection. So almost around the 1900, a lot of the overseas Chinese students 
for the intellectuals who began to think about the development of the imperialism in the future of the 20th century. We can find a lot of the, the documents in this period. So basically, in the general idea was trying to make distinction of the imperialism uh, uh, with uh, early empire. So for example, in a, a, a journal published by the overseas Chinese intellectuals in Japan, uh, that which means that the, the entitled the wise guide. He said that today's so-called imperialism is greatly different from Lapion imperialism. The imperialism practiced in North America is in fact territorial expansionism and invasionism in short. The contemporary imperialism is a form of the dictatorianism, namely a form of robberism. That's, that's the, their understanding of that. Here, the, the both uh, 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 Liang Qizhuo and other Chinese intellectuals was influenced by uh, Mingji, the progressive thinker and the socialist anarchist, Kotaka Shusi in Japan. He published in 1901, he published a book entitled The Monster of the 20th Century Imperialism. You can compare with this book and a long essay by Liang Qichao. He said that, the, that, that he, Liang Qichao's essay is entitled The Monster of the 20th Century. Trust, focus on the economics, e e e economic aspect. But the Kotoku Shusi's book entitled Monster of the 20th Century Imperialism in 1901, partly because different from later uh, the theorists on the imperialism in, in Japan, he tried to observe what happened in Japan. He thought that Japan is, is, is transformed into uh, imperialism. However, compared to America, Germany, Britain, and other European uh, the, the, the capitalist countries, the Japanese capitalism was still un, underdeveloped. So for him, the imperialism is not only the, 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 the products of the economic transformation, but the, is a more subjective aspect. That's the nationalists or the na nationalism. So he, he tried to combine the imperialism and the, the nationalism. The term national imperialism was invented in the, in the early 20th century in Japan at that time and used by many people. So in that sense, you can see the synchronous uh, 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 developments of the theories in the global, the, the different areas. For example, in the 19th century, uh, Liang Qizhou published the song of the 20th century Pacific Ocean. In 1901, Kotoko Shusi published the monster of the 20th century imperialism. 1902, that a very famous book, the, the uh, J. A. Hobson, the imperialism a study published. And in 1903, almost at the same year when Liang Qizhou published articles on the trust in America, 1903, Paul Lafargue was the lawing son of Karl Marx. He published a long essay, the, the Less Trust Americans. It's also working on the trusts in America. And of course, later in 1910, the root of Hibatin's finance capital, and in 1913, the Rosa Rosenberg's accumulation of capital, uh, and in 1914, Karl Korsky's ultra-imperialism, and in 1916, the famous book, Lenin's Imperialism, high, highest stage on capitalism, you can see the whole linear, uh, genealogy of theories on the imperialism here and there. I don't know what happened in Africa, but here in Asia, already in the beginning of the 20th century, they think about imperialism and they're trying to use the imperialism to theorize the idea of the 20th century. So that's the, the, the interesting uh, story. I give you a, another citation by the reformist, the, the uh, journals, 
if they say that it's in the Xingming Congbao, aided by Liang Qichao, which said that the 19th century is, I quote, the period when the Europeans competed among themselves. The 20th century, the period when the Europeans competed with external powers. The former pivoted on political competition and the later economic. So in the Chinese side, most of those, the, 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 the intellectuals or the revolutionaries, reformers, focus on aspect of economic aspect of imperialism. So here I can, we can list that what happened, the general backgrounds of a lot of things happened during that period. A lot, I, I list here the, some wars, for example, in uh, the, the 1894 to 1895, the Sino-Japanese War and the, the Treaty of Shimonoseki. And, and the, the Japan got the, got the, the uh, Taiwan and the, uh, the, the Northeast of China, but the, under the pressure of Russia and Germany and France, he, Japan was forced to return the South, uh, Northeast of China, uh, China to, to Qing Dynasty. So which means that the so-called uh, Vienna system still work, not really work uh, in Europe, but, but still work outside of the Europe. Maybe in 1899 to 1902, the Second Boer War, we can account it. But in Asia here was the Eight Nation Alliance and the preservation of China's integrity in 1900. That was the last performance of the Vienna system, maybe. And in 1902, the Anglo-Japanese Alliance reached. The, then the, the Russian Japanese War and the Treaty of Potsdam in 1904 to 1905. 1905, of course, the Russian Revolution. And in 1906, the socialist movement in Japan. And in 1910, the high treason incident, the Kotokushusi was sentenced to death. And in 1911, Chinese Revolution, the first Chinese Revolution. And in 1914 to 1918, the World War I, and in 1917, that's the Russian Revolution, of course, 1924, uh, the second Chinese Revolution again. So you can see a lot of things happened. So in that sense, the concept of the century conveys the epistemology that feeds the diverse spaces and their historical lineage into a universal vision of the synchronicity in which the relationships between China and the West, between the ancient and the contemporary, cannot be described with binary categories such as the West represented by science and the technology and the China by culture, which quite popular at that time, nor can it be regulated with European version of universalism. The notion of the century sim symbolizes the birth of a universal conception of history and the contem contemplations on the internal imbalance of these universalist history and the subsequent contradictions and the conflicts. So at that time, the dominant revolution for in, in, independence as a form against the imperialism, that kind of the revolution defined the, the beginning of the 20th century. So it's very interesting in 1901, uh, 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 Ziqiang, a very, it's, a, it's a quite active the activist uh, who was also in Japan, uh, the Chinese overseas uh, students. He, he said that, that because he observed what happened in Africa, for example, he said that the, now the Asia and Africa have just undergone the incidents in Philippines and in Transvaal because the, the American-Spanish War and the Boer War was happened almost the same time, the future conflicts between the independence and the imperialism would be way more intense than the revolutions in European countries. So you can see that the, how the new age of synchronicity emerged together with the concept of the century emerged uh, uh, together, the new idea of time. Now I move to the uh, part three, the creation of the preceding history 
of the 20th century and the contemporaneous correlation. Um, the, the preceding, the history of 20th century China came into being as it absorbs the external into the internal. The new political thinking had a certain anti-historical quality because now the Boer War or the what happened in Africa, what happened in Europe, what happened in Russia or Iran or others were all as a reference for Chinese reform and the Chinese revolution. So in that sense, the idea also shows the breaking through the conventional borders of historical narrative and including narratives of others in political thinking. So if we read that there's many, many the documents, publications, we can see that the most active, the both reformers and the revolutionaries or conservatives, when they argue each other about the Chinese uh, reality and its future, the reference was not, was not simply from our own history, the early history, like a Qing dynasty, Ming dynasty, or Confucius and so on and so forth but they will argue about the Russian Revolution. They argue about the nihilist party in Russia and the different views on the reform, conservative reform or the radical revolution. Or they talk about the French Revolution, Turkish Revolution, German question, American question, not mention Mingji Japan, that Mingji reform. So basically the debates on the reform and the revolution that took the reference from different regions and the different countries, which looks as our preceding history, the early history of our own to think about our future. So the whole idea transformed. So in that sense, the conception of the century and the political culture debates in the early 20th century were really linked closely. So you can find uh, different types of nationalism, globalism, and the characteristics of intellectual debates about China and the West, past and the present. The, the, you can define, you find the examples of, on the one hand is discursively often resulting to essentialist cultural differences. Well, we, we are very different from European or some others but substantially aiming to descend the position of China in a new global relations, namely the positions on the axis of the time and of spaces. So that's the difference, different positions here. So because of this, the intellectual debates were, it's, it's uh, different uh, dimensions because of this. So now I move to the last part the part four, the singular and the universal, the four dimensions of idea uh, of the century. Uh, the first dimension uh, of time, I think, because the, when the, uh, the, the idea of the 20th century or the century was together introduce the idea, new concept of time, especially the idea of evolution, the evolution of history, social formation and the nationality and so on and so forth. Most of famous book was uh, a, translate, a translation by Yan Fu, who was uh, uh, actually, who studied the naval technology in London, in, 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 in Britain, and uh, came back to China. To, he became a very famous translator, like uh, from the, uh, he translated uh, Thomas Huxley, book, Evolution and Ethics, and Edward Jung's History of Politics to introduce the, the theory of the evolution. And also he was the translator of John Stuart Mill and Adam Smith, Montesquieu, and many other classics were through his translation became very famous in China, huge influence. But most famous, most uh, important book was the Huxley's uh, the evolution and Essex, he together with the Edward Jung's uh, history of politics, because he gave a, a linear progressive narrative 
of history and integrated the China into that history. And immediately uh, the, he faced the challenge from other uh, the, the intellectuals. The, the one of the leading figures uh, uh, was the Zhang Taiyan. Zhang Taiyan uh, uh, was actually, he was the teacher. Maybe you know the fa very famous Chinese writer was thought as the father of modern Chinese literature, Lu Xun. Well, Lu Xun uh, in the early 20th century, in 1906 to the 1908, who studied with, uh, together with, uh, study with the Zhang Taiyan. So Zhang Taiyan was his teacher. He published a series of articles and books critic criticize the evolutionism and the social formation theory. The one very famous thesis was on paradoxical evolution. And, uh, and another was considerations of history of politics criticize the, the, the Edward Zhang theory of history. Basically, his theme of that art article was trying to delineate the difference between China's patriarchal society and the type of patriarchal society in Junks, the Edward Junks book. Basically, Junks thought that the China was still remain as a patriarchal society, so not as a no idea of citizenship and so on and so forth. He, the, the Zhang Taiyan tried to question his thesis, question the omission of histor historical diversity and the structure alternatives of social formation narrative. And then trying to develop a conception of the singular trajectory of historical transformation in China. So he also questioned the particularity of the universal theory instead of putting uh, the particularity of China against the, the, uh, the, the universality of theory. He argued that the European universal theory is particular. So in that sense, the patriarchal uh, society in, in Europe was only represent the certain type of the, the, the social formation. It cannot be uh, theorized and uh, use that theory to explain the other social uh, the formations in other, like in Chinese history. So he examines the mistakes when the theory was applied to China and attempt to reconstruct a universalism that include the singularity via the discussion of the singularity of Chinese history. He tried to use these to argue for. So the first debate was about the time, time's issue, whether or not is a linear development, so whether we have a universal uh, the, the narrative of history, we can use that the concept, the universal concept to, to explain the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, like a theory of the social formation to explain the certain uh, periods of the Chinese history. That's the, the first dimension of the time. The second dimension was the space. It's also related to the identity, reg uh, region, and the sovereignty. And here I uh, mentioned one figure was also the, 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 the later, he was a constitutionalist. He, he published a very, the maybe first systematic geopolitical book in the early uh, 20th century. So he, his book was about the uh, on the Jin and the Tie. Jin is a yellow middle, the money and the economy, and the Tie, the black iron, cannon and the military. He said that I'd like to see China becoming a country of Jin and the Tie, and in other words, an economic state and also a military state when synthesized an economic warring state. The warring state was the traditional term, employed the traditional term in a very early Chinese history, warring state period. But he used that the warring state, and this is a universe, uh, quite a popular in the later Qing time and early 20th century. A lot of the Chinese used that the warring state to describe the, uh, the phenomena of the nation states. But he said that we are, when the synthesized economic warring state means economic and military st uh, uh, the state, 
So he said that what is called the land of China today are a union of the land of five ethnicities. The five ethnicities, because basically at that time, uh, the first we learn from the West to translate the, the, the Chinese ethnicities into the race, the five race, the Mongolian, the Tibetan, uh, Islam, the Muslim, and the Han Chinese, uh, uh, Visa and the Manchuria. So who are called the people of China today, a union of the people of the five ethnicities, who come together on the one governing power to form a country around these country, various strong countries, a way to opportunity to invade, hence the theories of the preservation of the territorial integrity and of opening are developed to resist partition. To preserve the territory, Mongolia, Hui Muslim area and a Tibet must be preserved, which in turn necessitate the preservation of the sovereign. Subsequently, constitutional monarchy, but not democratic constitutionalism is the only option. This is the sole reason I support the constitutionalism. I quote from him. So here you see that the five ethnicities was based on the Qing dynasty, the composition of population and the, and the territory. At that time, he was, which was not only simply continuation of the older dynasty to the modern uh, the, the, uh, the constitutional monarch but actually he was response to the reflection on the limits of the European style, the nation state. Because at the beginning of the 20th century, a lot of the European thinkers and the intellectuals, they observed what happened in America, the rise of America, together with the huge empire of Russia. They thought that the, the small state was limited. So that's why they talk, think, rethink about the theories of the empire. Here, the Yang Du, actually, we, he, when he talked about this, was already to rethink about the empire. So the Zhang Taiyan, also the, the, the question for that, he published the article, the ex, uh, explication of the Republic of China in 1907. That was the first time the, the concept of the Republic of China emerged before the 1911 revolution. For him, that is how to resist and strengthen the political sovereignty of a historically formed multi-ethnic society under the imperial conditions. So that's, that's the whole idea. He tried to combine the idea of cultural identity, ethnic identity, and the political identity together to rethink about the contemporary China. So the debates on the national questions among the, 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 the these also echo to the, 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 uh, the, the same time, the, a lot of the European socialists, like Lenin, Otto Bauer, uh, Rosenberg, Karl Koski, it's, you can see that the, compare these Chinese debates and those debates in, in European socialists. And uh, it, it's like uh, the later, after the 1911 revolution, Sun Yat-sen said that the, the foundation of the country lies in the people to unite the lands of Han, Manchu, Mongol, Uyghur, and the Tibetan people into one country, is to unite the Han, Manchu, Mongol, Uyghur, and the Tibetan races into one people. Thus making a national unification. That's the senior sense inauguration statements as a provisional president. So you can see that at, at, he actually adopted the early reformist constitutional monarchist idea of the monarchy of the five ethnicities. Now, after the revolution, he talked about the republic of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the five ethnicities. So the, the, the question that the Republic of China uh, confronted was that not whether to reject 
other ethnicities or not, but to consider political decision which system to adopt. The first, the prefectures and the county system of pre-Han dynasties, which means that the centralized the administration is a more centralized formation of the state. And the second, the direct control of provinces in the Ming dynasty. Or the third, the geopolitical situation in the area of imperialism. So here, the, the, like a Korean, Vietnam, Burma was culturally more closer than Tibet, Mongol, and Islam. But it's, a, it's because of geopolitical consideration in the age of imperialism. So eventually, it's not simply the continuation of history, but also the, the understanding of the time of imperialism of the early 20th century, the rethink about the, the so-called territory issues, uh, the composition of, of, of the, uh, 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 the, the population, and so on and so forth. So here, these are uh, uh, the, the, the second dimension. The third dimension, I think, in interiority, it's being that I'm talking about the language and the subjectivity. Because in the whole 20th century, one of the most important transformation was the transformation or the reform of the language from classical Chinese to the vernacular Chinese and so on and so forth in modern literature. So here, the, there were also huge debates, different views here. The Kang Youwei, who published a very famous book, The Great Commonwealth or The Great Unity, he also, in that book, he discussed about the nature of the language. He said that spoken and the written languages are man-made and have infinite possibilities. But the easier and the simpler versions are adopted because they're sufficient to facilitate communication. They're unlike mathematics, law, and the philosophy, which have certain uh, inalterable axioms or principles. Therefore, complex and corrupted linguistic elements will be abandoned and the language merged to form one system. So, and some anarchists also, if we, if they say that the anarchists argue that if we decide to make China more and more civilized and to make education available to the whole country, the current system of writing must be abandoned and we must adopt as pronto. So at that time, they, they try to use that. But the Zhang Taiyan, Lu Xun, and those people, their understanding of the language is different. Zhang Taiyan argued that writing is a science for language. Language ban is a banner of thoughts. Though the languages are natural, but it's not because they existed in the universe from the beginning. The, the origins of language is by the efforts of man. Hence, the language roughly conforms to human happening. If there were disturb uh, disturbances in human events, so will language and the writings be disturbed. So here, the, the, the Lu Xun also argued the same, in, uh, along the same, though after, after, uh, in, uh, after the May Force, or the, during the May Force period, he changed to the radical idea for the vernacular moment. And that showed the rise of modern Chinese literature. The last dimension I described at uh, discussion here is about the so-called transcendence, the religions, morality, and the social ideas. It's very interesting. It, like uh, Lu Xun, he, he, he gave a very famous sentence. He said that uh, in 1907, he said that the, the urgent task before us today is to rid ourselves of the Hippocratic gentry, superstition itself, merry men. All these fail to provide us with any definition of a true system of belief at the outset, unless such a definition is established. How can we make comparisons which were revealed 
misleading nature of the superstition. So if you read this sentence and to imagine that the later years he was thought as the most important figure of the new enlightenment, the main force new enlightenment, main force literature, is his criticism of the so-called Hippocratic gentry was the enlightenment, the intellectuals actually, and argue the superstition itself, may remain, was very interesting for me. And at that time, there was a movement, religious movement, Confucianism, like a coming away for Confucianism, constructed Confucianism as a religion. Or the for Zhang Taiyan, constructed Buddhism as a philosophy of revolution. And uh, Liang Qichao also said that the, I regard the Confucianism as education and not religion. It emphasized the practice and not faith. Our country confronts a momentous problem where well, politics in China progress for lack of faith or due to the presence of faith. I argue faith has to be based on religion, which is not the ultimate principle of civilization. So here you can see that the, the uh, I, a lot of the, the, the examples we can uh, think about that. But later the whole 20th century revolution with uh, much more the vernacular or the secular revolution. But from the beginning you have a lot of the change is the undercurrents of the of the tr revolutionary trend was a re uh, uh, religious trend. So after the uh, the end of the revolution, you can find the revival in different areas, especially the countryside, or the even now the in a country in, in, in the urban sites, a certain kind of the revival of the uh, the, 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 uh, the the religions was a new phenomenon, of course. Uh, it, even for the scholars, how to under, understand the revolution, communist revolution as a belief system was what, what's the relationship with the religion is another uh, the, the big issue. So here I think I will be at the, uh, the, the, the end here with some comments here. So uh, the, the national revolution uh, moments and I think the revolution and the invention of the continuity was uh, the, the very important thesis for understand the 20th century China. So uh, the national revolution movement combined with the Buyua constitutional democracy, that's the, the, the allied with the social revolutions and the state building moments of the uh, certain socialist color. And the, the link between the revolution and the continuity, because now the historical narrative was more and more, as I said that at the beginning, a lot of historians argue that from so-called local history, which means that from the perspective of continuity to understand the 20th century China. But on the other hand, we really need to think about the, the relationship between the revolution and the so-called continuity. For me, it's neither a destiny of history nor the product of some cultural norm. I mean, this so-called continuity. It's the China was, looks very continuous. I mean, that long process, but that's born in unfolding of the specific historic events without the outbreak of the revolution, there will not be an issue of continuity as we discussed here, but the continuity cannot be simply treated as a natural extension of the revolution because a lot of the intervention, intellectual intervention, constructed that continuity. But look at the beginning of 20th century, obviously that the idea of time was really anti-historical. I stop here, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wang Wei. Um, I'm now more than convinced that we needed uh, an entire series of lectures, uh, but I think that uh, this, will, this will act as a trigger for us to, to organize lectures in future. So our first discussant uh, 
Dr. Ede Bangerezako. Um, Ede, as I said, is a postdoctoral fellow. She's a historian. Um, and uh, her, her thesis uh, has been looking at the uh, history of uh, Burundi uh, as written in the uh, colonial period and has been uh, thinking of uh, alternative ways uh, to rethink that history. Uh, Ede, please. Hey. Okay. Um, thank you very much for your paper, Professor. I don't know if you can hear me. Am I clear? Yes, yes. Yes, yes we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Professor Wanghui. It was very rich, the text. Um, thank you for taking us through the intellectual history of China. Um, it was a very rich journey. and. Uh, it echoes a lot of issues that we face when writing also our histories. Um, you, sh you really show us the importance of uh, space and time and, um, and the importance of thinking through um, our own sources, the sources that are written by uh, um, writers and how they reflect on changes happening um, during different periods of time. Um, so you show us this conceptualizing of the continent from outside and how it has influenced how we look at our own history, how history is written, um, almost at times a history by analogy is produced. Um, you give us this contrast between the histories in the West written in terms of medieval modern states and how our histories in terms of a tribal states um, and the lack of, of uh, any advanced societies. Um, so you show us the birth, you explain to us this birth of China as a modern political subject, which you question a lot, and you show us these foreign colonial sources, forces and um, how the imperialism and capitalism, all of them influence what happens within the state, the, sorry, the dynasty, um, and how it forces certain internal changes. Um, and and what happens throughout time. So you show us also, then you take a leap into the multiple rev revolutions in the 20th century and how they are interpreted. Um, so as you have said, there's a temporal demarcation and um, how, how do we, you ask us, how do we conceptualize time in the past? How do we view the past through different centuries? Instead of looking how time has also been conceptualized within our region, how is time understood if we step outside of looking at it through century? How do we conceptualize time? Um, so there's a lot that connected to um, your presentation when you were talking. And, and you also question um, these concepts and categories of the modern states, how, and you show us how they are appropriated and what a new political logic is produced as a result. So I would really love to hear more about this new political logic, which you explained, but I would like to hear from you what happens, um, what happens because you tell us that there's a new mode of thinking and theorizing that emerges um, and how, and how all these um, political concepts of the state, of sovereignty, they come from particular historical condition and how these lead to new movements, to new forms of consciousness. Um, so some of the questions I wanted to, I wanted to hear more about. Um, so you tell us about this form of state centralization that's coming from the outside, that it's influenced by all these foreign forces. What are the internal changes which are happening prior to that? Is it just mm -hmm. is this just the foreign forces which come and force the dynasty to change? But what could you tell us more? What what are the yeah. what other changes are happening? Um, mm -hmm. You also tell us that there's concepts these concepts of the modern state um, they restructured historical narratives. Um, so what, what concepts remained? What concepts, local concepts have been used to, to describe the um, political changes? And what new concepts 
I think you, sh you, you show us the new concept, but which, which ones are, are local and come to carry, to, to come to explain the changes that happen okay. within China. So you also show us um, how Confucian philosophies used to um, interpret uh, the changes that are happening. Um, I wanted to hear a bit perhaps more about the Confucian philosophy even up to today, if that is okay. possible. <laughs> And then uh, you explain to us this clashing of the heavenly and universal principle in terms of understanding revolutions in the 20th century. Could you tell us more about this heavenly principle that you talk about in the text? And you tell us about a horizontal movement of concepts which are appropriated and restructure historical narratives, um, you know, leading to this new politics. So, would, would there not be also a vertical movement of concepts which are imposed and uh, which, which kind of displace the local concepts? Would it just be looking at it in terms of horizontal? What, are, what about vertical impositions, even though mm -hmm. they may be appropriated? Mm -hmm. um, so then you, you tell us about this encounter and I wanted to know, um, so how do we, when we are writing um, history of histories uh, in the South, um, like from, we want to t tell more stories about um, our own knowledge systems and how do we write it in a way that non-Western knowledge is not, does not remain the other to the self of Western epistemology? How do we, how do we, do we make sure that what we are writing is not always seen through other sites? How does it not remain the other? How do we center our own sort of knowledge systems when we are writing our own history? Um, you also tell us about um, how through these, uh, the rise of the state sovereignty in the dynasty, I don't know how to pronounce uh, the Q-I-N-G, the word, sorry, the dynasty. Um, so you tell us about Qing, okay, thank you. Qing dynasty, thank you. So you tell us about a form of heterogeneity um, that is maintained. So you show us the sort of the continuities that are maintained within the Republic. And um, um, so what, is, so what is understood to have been lost and mourned? What is discontinued within, mm -hmm. within, uh, within these changes, within, from the dynasty to the Republic? Um, mm -hmm. And then also within, uh, so last year we were invited, me and my colleagues to China to a visit. Um, uh, we went to Jinhua, certain parts in China and we visited um, so beautiful monuments and museums. We went to the Silk Museum and uh, a lot of the time we felt that um, although um, with the, the talk was about China-Africa relations, whenever we, we went to different spaces, places it was more about, uh, like for example in the Silk Museum, it was more concerned with the European connection. It was less about trade and connection with Africa. Everything in the past was looking towards Europe. Um, so it, it was more, um, so it was, uh, um, it was more, the interest was to ally the past with this kind of ongoing um, connection with Europe. Um, so uh, in terms of Chinese civilization and less about an interest with with the rest of Asia or the rest of Africa. So how do you reflect about that also? Um, I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Ede. Um, Professor Wang Wei, I, I will go next and then you can respond to both of us, especially because uh, uh, my questions really dovetail into uh, what Ede has had to say. Um, mm -hmm. Now, my main point of interest in in uh, uh, in, in the two introductory essays uh, was on 
what you set out at the beginning is the challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, how to translate and use concepts from foreign languages. Mm -hmm. Concepts like nation, sovereignty, um, how to think through the interaction with local conditions. Um, and you begin by telling us that numerous categories and subjects in Chinese writings were repetitions from European works. Um, but at the same time, they were not just mere repetitions. Uh, the journey involved the process of translation, adaptation, and invention. And it laid the path of a new politics. So it's against this, un with this understanding that, that I have three questions. Mm -hmm. So my first question uh, is on the question of history. Uh, the second question is about uh, politics and the state. And the third question is on uh, universalism. So let me begin with the first one. And this you talked about uh, in the talk uh, about how the Christian notion, the Christian concept of the century um, acquires a broad significance at the end of the 19th century, how in the 20th century it is no longer possible to understand the self in the context of the old order. It calls for uh, and is in fact met by original thinking uh, beginning in the 20th century. And so the paper then moves on to talk about historiography and we have basically a, well, you tell us, you, you, you focus on European historiography. Um, and you, you, you tell us that uh, uh, basically, I'm not going to be as polite as you were, but basically how Eurocentric uh, mm -hmm. is, is, is the writing of, of, uh, of Hobsbawm, um, and even to some extent, Hobson and Lenin. Um, to some extent, and, and, and I can explain why not wholly. Uh, so you, your ambition is, is not to tell the story as Hobsbawm does, uh, uh, as from a European point of view, 20th century is a European century, but to, to think of a spatial shift, uh, to think of it as a century from a Soviet and a Chinese standpoint. Um, but you also have another uh, purpose, which is, and this comes out in your critique of Hobson and Lenin, uh, which is that the 20th century theories of imperialism are mainly economic theories, and, they've, and therefore they focus on changes in the center. Um, they, they think of imperialism as a new form of capitalism. Uh, whose expansion is not necessarily based on territorial conquest and expansion. And to this you counterpose uh, Mao Zedong, uh, that the key is not the economic, but the political. And the key is not changes in forms of capitalism, but in forms of resistance. And then I'm still summarizing how I read you. Um, you say that there is a lesson to the 20th century, which is the attempts to challenge capitalism from the outside failed. And this was the USSR, Eastern Europe. Yeah. Um, and you put forward China as a different attempt, not an attempt to challenge capitalism from the outside. You say it has transformed the world, but we don't get a sense of in what ways this is not an mm -hmm. attempt to challenge capitalism mm -hmm. from the outside. Mm -hmm. So, at the end of this uh, discussion on, on historiography, what we understand that there is a new concept of time, um, kind of uh, a linear time, uh, which is global. Um, and to this linear and global time, you are counterposing um, 
multiple temporalities. Uh, and therefore, one would think multiple histories. So we have a clear sense of this universal history project, which has developed through the 20th century. I don't have a very clear sense of what history would read like, look like, uh, as an expression of multiple temporalities. Is there room in the notion of multiple temporalities for a universal history? Um, and, and if so, what would that be? So that's my first question. My second question is on the question of politics and the state. And, and your basic contention is that there is not a single genealogy of the state. There mm -hmm. are multiple genealogies of the state. And so you give us your understanding of the Western genealogy of the state. And then you talk about a Chinese genealogy of the state, how I understood it. Um, so again, we're back into the terrain of a linear versus multiple temporality, kind of. So the most interesting part of your discussion of the Western genealogy of the state, I thought, was your discussion of Carl Schmitt. Um, a, a Carl Schmitt's uh, understanding that the 16th century, it was not just a struggle between European countries, a new imperialism versus old imperialism, like Hobson and Lenin would talk about it, or between the church and secular power, but actually as a contest inside religion between Catholicism and Protestantism, two different ways of being and thinking. Um, and, and, uh, um, and you say the centralization of political power was not a consequence of centralization of means of production, but a response to internal political crises. So the outcome uh, is the state is the sole form of political organization. The word soul, has to, I underlined it anyway when I read it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so the sovereign state is established, by, is established by omitting differences from the course of history and suppressing various forms of historical time. In Anderson's words, homogeneous empty time. What we today call one size fits all. Right? When we talk of the IMF and structural adjustment, one size fits all. That's universal, mm -hmm. homogeneous, empty yeah. time. Um, now, you then follow up with the genealogy of the Chinese state. You say that there's a constant theme, or you don't say it, but I, that's how I read it. There's a constant theme in Chinese political history which is on the one hand, a struggle for political unity, unified territory, but based on cultural diversity. Okay. Um, and you, you, you tell us that the epoch of the state emerged more than 20, 000, 2000 years ago with the Qin dynasty. Um, and then how the Qin dynasty, the Qing decided to reform itself as a sovereign state with internal cultural multiplicities. This theme runs through the 17th century, Neo-Confucianism, the First Republic, because everywhere the focus is on unity and plurality. Okay, political unity based on social cultural plurality. Um, even early 20th century Chinese intellectuals imagine a vast polity based on diverse cultures. The revolutionaries talk about five nationalities. Now, I assume this is an unfinished conversation. And I assume that there is a big debate, discussion, even contest inside China now. Because mm -hmm. the reading one gets outside China is that the dominant line seems to be not unity based on multiplicity of cultures, but increasingly a striving for a unity of cultures. And I say this from what is happening in the Tibetan and the Uyghur areas. Um, so that's my second question. Um, it would be 
fantastic. Maybe this is all in the book and you can just tell us that. Read pages this and this and we have been. So my third question has to do with universalism. Um, and again, I echo uh, uh, Ede's uh, uh, request that uh, you need to tell us more about heavenly principles. Um, and, and because the suggestion was for me that it's an alternative to the universal principle. Is it? I mean, did I misread it? If so, what is? Because it obviously cannot be based on particularity. It is, it is the heavenly, heavenly principle. Um, and, but I was, I was struck by the different illustrations that you gave. Uh, Yan Fu, who critiques the theory of evolution and says, it is not the strongest, but the most flexible who will survive. Uh, <laughs> Zhang Taiyan, excuse me for mispronouncing, yes. but that's part, part of learning. So Zhang Taiwan, um, who says something I had, couldn't quite figure out, says the only way to achieve universalism is by breaking with the value system known as universal by breaking with universal values. And finally, and this I loved, Lucian's hometown, the story mm -hmm. about a path that does not exist until it is taken. How beautiful <laughs> is that? I mean, that is an ode to creativity, uh, invention, politics, mm -hmm. humanity, everything. Um, now you relate this to Mao's thought, which you present as nonlinear, um, and you say the focus on revolution or revolution shifts focus from the center to the weakest link. I see echoes of Lenin's road to Paris and London may lie through Beijing and Calcutta, right? Something yeah. like that. I, yeah. I, I, I remember that. Um, and, and you talk of his analysis of the, of the, of the weakest link as being, excuse me, this is my phone just working on its own. Um, so, so in some ways uh, it, would be, it would be very good to he hear a continuation of this process of translation, adaptation, innovation, uh, to, 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 to hear this story as a, as a work in progress. Uh, so to hear the unfinished side of this story, uh, not just to look at how we may think of the 20th century, but where are we now? Mm -hmm. yeah. what, is, what, what are the options? Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now I try to answer this. Thank you, Heide and uh, Mahmoud. So, um, I maybe I I'm I'm not sure whether or not I can answer these uh, all very rich and uh, profound questions. Not uh, I try. Uh, the first I think it's about the uh, uh, some the Hele also mentioned that uh, what kind of the uh, I think that the, the centralization issue together with the political state issue, I mean, the combine these two together, and also the, uh, the some local concepts and the whole, whole translation issue together. Um, the first of all, at the beginning, of course, uh, no, in, in the later chain, in the early 20th century, the most of the Chinese literati and the intellectual, they still use a lot of the Chinese the concepts and uh, to imagine the world and uh, think about the Chinese history. As I said that, uh, for example, they, they described the uh, imperialism era as an uh, age of warring state. The warring state was a very special period uh, uh, before, the, before the first dynasty, the first emperor, that, uh, that was a warring state a lot of the feudal state uh, 
fighting each other. And uh, the warring state was also, it's interesting that uh, it's not only for Chinese, the, those uh, the intellectuals, but also a uh, lot of the uh, Western observers try to employ that the, the idea to understand the global situation. I give the two examples. Uh, when uh, the, uh, uh, the the missionary, American missionary, um, uh, W.A. Martin, who was the, uh, the translate of the principle of international law by the Henry Whitton's book, was translated in 1860s into Chinese. Of course, he employed a lot of Chinese terms. And uh, at that time, when, uh, uh, when he decided to translate that book, he argued that why uh, China had a lot of the conflicts with Britain or the Western powers after the Opium War, because China had no knowledge about the international law. They don't know how to do the treaties and so on and so forth. So that's why, that's the reason I translated the international law into Chinese to show you that uh, what you, this is the norms and the principles. But in 1881, there was a conference in the uh, International Peace Conference in Berlin, in Germany. He was there too. He gave a talk in front of the Western audience. When he stayed in China, he worked with a lot of the Qin the officials and the authority. He became familiar with Confucianism and so on and so forth. So in 1881, when he said that he in front of the Western audience, he tried to convince the Western country and the Western audience that the first international law came from China, not from Europe. He saw that the, the Confucius himself was the foreign minister of the Lu state and the, the, the spring autumn annals was a kind of the international law. So he tried to, so the warring state or the unity empire and all these terms came out to describe the, the, uh, 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 the new the situation. Inter interestingly enough, after that, Kang Wei, Liao Ping, and many Chinese intellectuals began to use the, 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 the Confucian theory and the concepts to describe the whole global phenomenon. So following that uh, together was, you can see that, that together. Of course, after the main force movement, the situation transformed because after the uh, educational system, the reform, vernacular reform, a lot of the overseas Chinese came back to involving the reform of the education system and the rewriting of the textbook for the primary school, middle school, or in the universities. So there was standardization of the uh, concepts. One is a scientific concept, but also the uh, 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 social scientific concepts. So like a feudal system, a slavery, uh, capitalism, communism, and, uh, and so on and so forth, all these terms. That's why I mentioned in the footnotes that the uh, last decade, we had a long debate about this, for example, the whole 20th century Chinese revolution was again so-called anti-feudal revolution, anti-feudalism revolution. So a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, 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 historian argue that this is a completely mistake. It's a com it's a mistake because the, the uh, feudalism is a social formation was in Europe which totally different from the concept of fengjie in Chinese. We use the fengjie to translate the feudalism. But on the other hand, yeah, there was a debate. I give you another, maybe uh, another example, give you an example. A very famous Confucian scholar, his name is uh, Liang Shumin. He had a debate with Mao, both during the war and after the, uh, the establishment of PRC, he had a public debate with Mao. Uh, 
uh, when during the war time, uh, it was in Yang'an. He visited Yang'an. He talked to the Mao. He said that the Communist Party's analysis about Chinese society was wrong because you use the class or the class struggle to explain the Chinese society. However, we are in an uh, agricultural society. We have no such differentiation between different class. So this only happened in the industrial society. So you are wrongly use the Western European concept to describe the situation. However, it's interestingly enough, the Liang, Liang Zhuming also was the, the, the launched moment for the rural construction. He said that the China was, there was a gentry, there was a peasants, some landlords, gentry, and so on and so forth. Uh, in the level of descriptive level, up to now, the, most of people believe that the Liang, Liang Zhuming's analysis is more accurate than the Communist Party's analysis. However, the land reform became much more successful under the, uh, the Communist Party land reform agenda. So Liang Zhuming was also frustrated about this phenomenon. So in this case, we can understand the concept when the translation of the Western concept to describe the situation is not only the concept, it's a literary conception, but also the social moments trying to use these concepts to put forward some political agenda. So it's a constructive, constitutive forces, not only the only the linguistic translation. So that's why the repetition and the difference happened in these contexts. So a lot of, now we still use that the, another term, the, the, the dichotomy of the feudal and the centralized administration. Centralized administration in Chinese, we translate the Jinxian system. That's the very long, more than 2000 history that was already had this kind of the system arrangements. A lot of people believe that after now the structure of the from the county to the top level of the government to provincial level was really came from there. So that the basic structure, but the administrative structure was long. So there was some reasons like a recent book by the Francis of Kuyama, for example, and uh, he talked about the, um, the state issue, uh, uh, the state capability. He said that the, uh, the, the maybe the first modern state came from China because much earlier centralized formalist administration already established in China very early. And the uh, rule of law, of course, he argued that it came from the, uh, the, the, the Europe. This is another case, whether or not that's correct, but the people continue to use this concept to understand the, uh, uh, and not only to understand, but also historiography was also trying to employ these terms to, to re-narrate uh, our own history. That's the uh, one issue. Second is, I think the, uh, the, the, uh, both Hede and uh, Mahmoud also mentioned that the Helena principle issue. It's interesting, uh, the topic, Helena principle uh, was mainly established, is an early concept, but mainly conceptualized in the 11th century. 11, 12th century, that became very a crucial concept of the con Song Confucianism. From maybe from 10, 11, 12th century, that's the period established. Why that concept became so important for the more than 1,000 years for the Chinese electorate? Because the Confucianism in the Confucian time, the first the focus on the so-called rights and the music practice, nothing to do with some transcendent concept of like a heavenly principle and so on and so forth. 
At the same time, in the Han Dynasty, the second uh, uh, dynasty, uh, there was a cosmological concept of the heaven or Tian. Is, uh, basically, this is a cosmological. The heavenly principle, the people believe that a lot of the, uh, the scholars argue that the, 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 the concept, the rise of the concept of heavenly principle represent the breakthrough of so-called philosophical breakthrough or ontological breakthrough in China, which means that uh, we cannot simply follow norms of rights, but try to understand each thing that there was a, the, the principle became imminent. So it's universal, but it exists in different things and uh, in different ways, in different things. But even it's different, but still the universal, the heavenly uh, the principle is universal. That's, I think, uh, to some extent, the philosophical foundation for thinking about the universal and the singularities. So you need to find the methodological way, method, methodologies to study different things, to un understand the singularity. That singularity itself was the, uh, that itself is the representation of the uh, universal. That's the, uh, the, the, the heavenly principle, the, the idea. So that's very important after this uh, Qing Dynasty, the uh, Song Confucianism has been dominant. So-called new Confucianism in the 20th century mainly was the Song Confucianism. So that's why they revived that the concept of the heavenly principle. This is the, the one of the issue. And also they argue that that was so-called trying to compare with later, some scholars trying to compare it with the idea of the transcendence in the West philosophy, because they saw that the transcendence to sum up, but these are imminent transcendence, inwardness, to certain kind of the different things inside of the difference. So you find that the, the universe, so the universal. So this is the, uh, the heavenly principle. That was, I think that the, interesting enough, why I think the 30 years ago, I had a long dialogue with the Professor Mitsukuchi Yuzu from Tokyo University, who, who already passed away, older generation Confucian scholars. At that time, he read my uh, long essay on the concept of science in, in modern China. He said that, uh, so interesting, compared to the concept of science in China and the uh, concept of, of science in, in Japan uh, were very different partly because the concept of science in China represent a kind of the system, the whole, every, covered everything. It, it's not uh, only focused on the technological science or the scientific focus on the natural phenomena, but moral issue, aesthetic issue, cosmological issue, belief issue, were all organized into it. So that's what he said that the, he even argued that, that's why he argued that, that even Mayfor's anti-traditional idea, because the science was one of the slogans, even that idea represented the structure of the heavenly principle. So in that sense, the way you can find, on the one hand is a, uh, uh, a counter argument with the traditional uh, the world view, but on the other hand, structurally speaking, it's some overlaps there. So that's why he found some way of thinking in modern China was still represents the certain kind of spirit of the heavenly principle. That's the uh, the uh, uh, the Mizukuchi's uh, the the arguments for for that. And Haide also mentioned that uh, your uh, the visit to China. You are right. The uh, most of most of the uh, the Chinese museum were either I think that different trends either focus on Chinese history or the contemporary arts, which very universal to some extent. It was quite quite similar with any kind of the museums in other 
the uh, metropolitan or, uh, the, or other uh, countries, but much less about Africa. But of course, there was a change. In Tsinghua University, we had a recent, uh, have a last year, very successful exhibition from uh, Afghanistan or some other exhibition from, the, uh, uh, from, from uh, Iran and India. This is more and more, but obviously the, uh, the, the China and the West were still the dominant themes for most of the exhibitions. But these are the, the long tradition, this is a Eurocentric or the Chinese centric view were still uh, the, uh, the, there. And uh, here I, um, yes, I move to the Mamouri's question, history. Uh, I think that uh, it's a very complicated question <laughs> to reach. I don't know how to, but basically you're right that the uh, 20th century, I still think that the Russian Revolution and the Chinese Revolution were together with the national liberation movements in everywhere, were most important themes for the 20th century, which was very different from 19th century French, Britain, and even American Revolution. It's in a non-Western revolutions, in a happened in the marginal areas, the first. And without the Russian Revolution and the Chinese Revolution, we also difficult to understand the national re revolution developed in this way. Of course, they will have the different so interconnected. The Africa, uh, the, for example, the slogans the, uh, in, in Chinese, Ya Fei La, Asia, African, uh, Latin America, as a unity, is a slogan for that. What's only happened in the 20th century because of this revolution. So these are ideas. And the, behind this idea, so-called oppressed nations or the, independent, the nation, national liberation for the independence was still, I think, that under the influence of certain kind of the Leninist way for transform the class structure into the national or ethnic or the different regional uh, inequality relations, but still the, the basic uh, relations. So that's why I think that uh, because now it's difficult that the Soviet Union disappeared completely and all the Eastern European countries transformed. So the historical narratives were much more tend to, to some extent national, again, became national history in that sense. Of course, the, the, the 20th century revolution was a lot were national revolution. However, contained strong uh, uh, tendency for the internationalism. So that's why I think that the, if we, in order to understand the 20th century, no matter, of course, the Russia, both Russia, China, a lot of tragedies, a lot of the problems happened during the 20th century revolution. But globally speaking, without these two revolutions, it's difficult to understand the whole 20th century. So that's why still, I think that the revolution as a theme for the 20th century was still important. And of course, that the question that the, I, I think that the, I didn't give, as, as, as Mahmoud said that the, at the beginning, I give some implications not, not clear the, the orientations, partly because we don't know what, what, what kind of the implication or the, what kind of the uh, uh, significance of that the 20th century tradition, uh, both like a Russian revolution and Chinese revolution for the future, what's, what's going on? Of course, Russia, Eastern European were all transformed. China still remain a big question how to de describe the Chinese society. The political structure framework was still came from that the 20th century. Of course, now the more and more people argue that there was a huge background of the Chinese tradition. But still, I think that the, for example, the political party stru structure or and the party and the state structure 
were really from the 20th century and they continue to play the role. How to evaluate? It is a big question, a big issue. I'm, I have no uh, single answer for, for the uh, simple answer for these. I, I write something in different ways. Well, some were critical, some were, I think, some legacies we can elaborate for the reality for the future. Two, um, I think that they're also related to uh, the early questions of that the, what's the special, like uh, uh, horizontal and the vertical, and so on and so forth. Chinese Revolution, as I say that uh, in, in, in my paper, to talk about the, uh, the, the weakest link and the people's war was the, the long process of uh, very profound the creation of the subjectivity of the people, which majority of that was the peasants. The peasants played the role of the so-called proletarian revolution as a pioneer of the proletarian, and uh, which is not economic issue, but a political issue. So that's, uh, I think that uh, was very important, which not only transformed the, 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 the political nature or the character of the Chinese peasants, but also transformed the political nature or the political, uh, the, 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 the uh, character, character of the Communist Party itself. Because up to now, it's difficult to understand. I mean, without that background, to understand the political uh, system, especially the, the Communist Party system. That was really came from the, uh, the People's War period. It was not uh, simply, well, Chinese pa Communist Party, we know that uh, established in the 1921st, or the, from 1920 to 1921st, by those intercommunity. I mean, the, the, uh, uh, some Dutch, some Indian, and some Russian, they came to China to help Chinese to, to build up the Chinese CCP. But I think that the fundamental transformation was happened after the, the rural stru structure, the rural war, the move the whole peasants into that the land revolution that not only the transform the rural society, but also transform the political party itself. How to understand this party is a still the big question. I mean, in order to understand the Chinese future, we need to understand how to understand the connection and the tra con contemporary transformation of that the, 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 the CCP and, and these uh, the political systems. So that's the, uh, and this is the, the, uh, the so-called, the, that's why a lot of the huge debates in China last decade about the uh, so-called Chinese road or the Chinese model, whether or not there was such thing. Or some people will say there's no such thing as a model. I'm not using that term model, but Chinese road or the Chinese experience, how to understand it is, I think this is a basic without the understanding of the uh, 20th century Chinese revolution is difficult to understand contemporary transformation, though there were the ruptures between the two episodes. So this is the, 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 the uh, 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 question. And the political state issue is also the, uh, as I think is, uh, 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 first of all, the centralization of the political, uh, the state, I think it's the first, uh, it's a long process. Some in the 19th century was uh, the overlaps with the, the, the challenges from the West and the cent more for the centralization. But on the other hand, those unified, there's a big uh, the dynasties. There was a, from the beginning, there was a long process of the centralization. So this is the, the one of the, uh, uh, the aspect of the uh, situation. One of the issue that the uh, so-called unity or the variety of the, uh, 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 the multiplicity of unity and so on and so forth, were obviously was based on the framework of the uh, nation state now. Uh, 
even you argue for the multiplicity, when you talk about the unity, it was about the sovereignty. It's a, it's a nation, it's a sovereign state were uh, the, the issue. But the only thing that I would like to emphasize that in the Qing Dynasty was very, to some extent, it's special. And not that special because a lot of the, uh, the Chinese dynasties, large scale dynasties, were ruled by minorities, not by majorities. Qing Dynasty was the ruling elite was Manchu. When the Manchu conquered the China proper in the 17th century, which aligned with the Mongol and thus the Tibetan. So in that sense, the, 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 the five ethnicity of the five nationality of Monarch was based on the model of old empire, old dynasties. But as I say that uh, in the early 20th, late 19th century, especially 10, early 20th century, a lot of the European uh, thinkers already began to reflect the limits of the European style of nation states. They saw that it's a small. So that's why they thought that the 20th century would be dominated by some big empire. They thought that the America was a very possible the model. That's why the Yangzhou, as I said, that the, that's the first geopolitical the thesis. They try to imitate that kind of the empire idea to create the monarch of the five ethnicity. So that's the, uh, the, the whole situation was uh, the, the, uh, uh, this uh, on the one hand is an imitation of the order in, in, in front in, uh, in count with the, uh, the Western challenges, but also based on the Qing historical formation to think about this. Of course, these logic, once you have the, 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 the logic of the unity, you have the logic of the separation. So that's the uh, all, always uh, came from here. But the separation moment was also follow the same logic of the nationalism. So that's the, uh, the whole the logic. I mean, the unity issue or the separation issue were in that sense were based on the same logic of the national uh, reason. So this is the, the here, uh, and then you have a lot of the, the conflicts. Again, these kind of the backgrounds, some people trying to retrieve some early experience in the Chinese history to think about what kind of the system can hold the difference or the difference together, not necessarily one like a like a it's a, a formalistic form of unity, but a certain kind of different, more flexible connections and so on and so forth. That's why the, the people try to revive the concept of like the tributary relations or the, the or under the heaven or some other kind of the, uh, relationships. But in any case, these were all these happened in the international framework of the, uh, the nation states solving sovereignty issues. So not still uh, the, uh, uh, the, the limited to, to these the issues. And the weakest link, I, I think it's a, uh, the, yes, it's a Lenin's idea. But the Lenin's idea, when, the, when he talked about the weakest link, is talk about the uh, weakest nations. But the Mao were trying to transform that uh, change into the domestic uh, 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 political relations. So he saw that the, in each society, you have a different weakest link. So in that sense, the whole revolution started from there. And also he argued that uh, right, weakest link is not only the, really these area, uh, because the weakest link for Lenin was from the uh, the uh, developments of capitalism, you are weaker in the, in the capitalist system. For Mao, it's when the weakest link became the weak, weakest link, 
partly because you have the revolutionary force there. So you have the, subject, the subjective forces, not only the objective, the condition. So that only combined together, that link became weak, uh, weakest. So that's the, the, the whole idea. He gave the example. He said that, the, for example, in Tibet or the Qinghai, Tibetan areas is a very weak, but not the weakest link because no revolutionary force at that time. But some other places you have different social forces for the class struggle or the for, for the social struggle. So he, he, he tried to uh, develop that idea of the weakest link. And uh, these idea, of course, these are the, the four, the, the, for, for our generation or the for older generation, they're familiar with concepts. For the younger generation, we're not necessarily familiar with this the idea. But still, the weakest link as a political concept is for the social struggle. It's a, for the su a strategic thinking about the social struggle where we can find the way and where is the, at the point we can launch the breakthrough. So it's a, the political uh, 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 strategic thinking were there. So in that sense, I think this idea for us will still have some uh, uh, maybe inspiration we can learn from here because the, uh, the, now the strategic thinking was belong to that generation. Uh, for the academia, or for example, uh, it's more important that it's different political position, a political value and a position, but not really the strate strategic analysis about the situation. So that the situation and a, 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 a strategic thinking for the breaking through was most important for that generation, I think. And also this is a, the lesson we learn from the, uh, uh, that generation of revolutionaries. So I just, I'm not really can uh, answer fully your question, just some responses here, very limited. Thank you so much. Um, Limited is another way of saying they open up an entire field of exploration. Thank you so much. So what I propose to do now is, uh, I think I will, I will recognize four people rather than three uh, with uh, a stipulation. Uh, you will have no more than two minutes to uh, frame your question or your comment. Uh, no more than two questions, please. One question is fine, two is the maximum, okay? So the four that I will recognize, uh, the first one is uh, Anna, uh, Anna Kartik from uh, Makerere Institute of Social Research. Uh, Anna is a final year student. She's writing a thesis. Uh, second one is, uh, Conrad Masabo from the University of Dar es Salaam. Uh, third is uh, David uh, Chimba Ngendo, who just successfully defended his thesis last week. Okay. Uh, and the fourth one is, uh, again, excuse my pronunciation if it's wrong, Shannon Jin uh, from SOAS uh, okay. in London. Um, so, Anna, shall we begin? Yes, Professor. Um, and thank you so much, Professor Van Hoi, for joining us today. It's a really great opportunity. Um, I have two questions, and I will restrict to two minutes. The first question is um, about how should we consider or understand the ideas of repetition and displacement and multiple temporalities uh, in the essay in relation to history of modernity, uh, especially the history of political modernity. Are we referring to um, a single linear modernity across multiple temporalities or multiple modernities in a single oh. temporal and spatial context? Okay. Or okay. are we referring to multiple modernities within multiple temporalities? 
Um, so um, the question would be, does the argument cons um, concern the multiple temporalities, which may also translate to an argument of multiple modernities? Mm. Uh, my second question is a question concerning the quest uh, hierarchy. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back to the same uh, principle, heavenly principle. The imperial history gives us varied forms of uh, hierarchy and the question of hierarchical structure a recurrent concern to different uh, administrative and governing elites in China. Yes. But yeah. I'm particularly drawn to uh, the Song Confucianists who upheld the principle of heaven to be the source of legitimacy. Uh, mm -hmm. This was while, as I understand, the objective remained to be the administrative hierarchy of the increasingly centralized uh, prefectural system and the proto-nation state of Song then demanded separate and shared power in local communities. So the question is, what kind of hierarchy is being critiqued or defended or justified in this essay if, they are, if there's a kind of hierarchy that has been described at all? Thank you, Professor. Thank you once again. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the second question is from uh, Conrad uh, Masabo, University of Dar es Salaam. Conrad. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Wang. Uh, reading your essay and listening to your talk, I got an impression like um, you are challenging the Western thinking system, the so-called analytical or linear thinking, in favor of something I read when I was in China about correlative thinking that is found dominant within traditional Chinese thought. And I, I, look, I, I understood you like as if you are privileging the so-called yin-yang thinking system as a theoretical lens to guide your reading of modern China. So my question is, if I understood you this way, is it a fair treatment of your thought and your way you presented your case in these two essays, in these two essays and your, your presentation? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, David uh, Chimbangendo from uh, MISA, David. I want to thank Prof. Um, Wang Wei for this lecture. Uh, one question is about uh, periodization. I think David, I am, can you, uh, no, I am okay. fully... Am I logical yeah. boy now? That's fine, yes, yeah. Okay. I am, uh, my first question is about periodization. I am convinced uh, with the contextual... Periodization, uh, periodization right? I, Sorry? What? Periodization. Sorry. Now, Periodization, right? Right. So uh, I, I want to understand that if, if periodization is um, an historically produced device of time, uh, then, then I, want to I want to understand from you, Prof, uh, in, which temporal, in which kind of temporality then do you place 20th century China? That's my first question. What? I'm still question. not. Uh, can you? Can you? Uh, can you? I'm sorry. I'm not. Not here clearly. Uh, can you simply put it? Yeah. Okay. I think my first question is: uh, uh, In which kind of temporality do you place uh, 20th century China? Okay. All right. And my second question. Is, is um, I, I take it that uh, uh, the book or the article I read is about uh, looking at 20th century China as an object of thought. 20th century China as an object of thought. So, uh, in, in which sense? In which sense is this object of thought? Uh, is it in an ontological sense as a 20th century existing out there, or? A little more in a dialectical sense, as in a relation with something else. I, I mm -hmm. want clarity on that. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. And the uh, final question is from uh, Xianan Jin. 
Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Wan. Uh, I have this set of questions sort of echoing with Professor Mamdani's question about where we are now. Sort of thinking about, I have this impression from your presentation that the revolutionary politics and history in the 20th century has been lost in today's politics. So I'm thinking, so today, if the ideological foundation for the Asia, Africa, Latin America solidarity, or some people call it third uh, worldism, was revolutions in the 20th century. So in the 21st century now we're living, is it still possible to find and organize ourselves around third world solidarity? Uh, and, do you, and the second question would be, do you think this sort of third world solidarity is contracting uh, opposite to the political development of nationalism in China? Um, yeah, so that's are my two questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, I, I try to, it's a, a Anna's question, repetition and multiple, but I actually, this is a very good question, reminded me, I didn't answer the question that the Mahmoud early raised the issue of these multi multiplicity and, uh, and the repetition issues. I think that the, uh, I didn't use the, uh, I didn't use the multiple modernity all the modernities here, but obviously uh, you you have to uh, understand the multiplicities in the world. However, that was at the same time when I talk about these, I was I'm I'm using another term of synchronous uh, synchron uh, synchronicity. So the the whole difference and the multiples was happened within the new framework of synchronicity. That's why the relationship, that's why I also mentioned that the time was not only the vertical, but also the horizontal. Horizontal means that also contain the multiplicities within the synchronicity. I think this is the, uh, um, and later, uh, if you, I allow me to mention that the Zhang Taiyan, uh, as he later in 1910 published a book uh, on, on the so-called equality of all things. He used that. He tried to understand uh, the multiplicity, not in terms of the multiplicity or the singularity, but he tried to deconstruct the discursive, I mean, the, the order, the hierarchy. And he used the uh, Buddhist philosophy to do that. And uh, he used the term, uh, means that the, uh, in Chinese is a wu, mean the things, different things. He tried to shift the focus from the subject and the object to different things. The human being as something in the world or in the cosmos, different things. So, he argued that all the things, there was certain kind of the so-called equality of all things in order to criticize the formalistic idea of equality, but not, not use the hierarchy, but try to continue to use the concept of pindang, that the Buddhist concept of pindang to translate the, uh, the equality means that the to see the individuality or the singularity of each things. So which also contain ecological thinking, not to see the people also in the world, I mean, in, in the whole and the nature. So in that sense, he continued that, the thinking. Uh, that I, I wrote something long ago about these but recently there was a lot of the achievements, academic achievements on these, the thought, I mean, the Zhang Bingling's early idea. He tried to combine the Buddhist philosophy, Zhuangzi, together with the Western ideas to rethink about this basic concept, give a totally different concept of equality and so on and so forth, which also give you the possibility to rethink about the hierarchy. So because the, basically hierarchy was, uh, 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 the concept was uh, 
other side of the equality. But the equality, the modern concept, the equality was mainly formalistic. And uh, for example, we conclude the treaty on equal treaties by the needs of formalist equal subject to sign that uh, unequal treaty, which means that the equality also the uh, so equality itself could be the uh, 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 represent the, the hierarchical structure of the of the modern world. So what kind of the new concepts we can develop to re rethink about this? So Zhang Taiyan's, uh, the some people, conservat more conservatives, uh, the thinking were trying to legitimize the traditional concept of hierarchy. The ji or feng wei means the order. But Zhang Taiyan tried to continue to use the concept of pinda, means equality, but the reinterpret and uh, keep the distance from the formal idea, uh, concept of the, the equality to rethink about the world. So this is a very critical thinking the possibilities. As for the, uh, the, the heavenly principle, is a heavenly principle where, be, yes, you are right, that uh, every dynasty, the rulers, try to use the heavenly principle to legitimize its ruling system. But on the other hand, we also see that the, most of the resistance and rebellions also appropriate or the youth employed the principle of, of the heavenly principle to, to, to throw down the older dynasty for the revolution and so on and so forth. So the heavenly principle had a lot of the potentials. It's not only because, of course, there was a, a, the, the internal concept of order within this idea, but that order was give some potentials for the resistance and the rebellions. So that's why you can argue that in the early, in, in the, uh, later Qing period, they will argue that the revolution is a heavenly principle based on that. So a lot of the, uh, these kind of the ideas also developed. So that the heavenly principle was uh, a concept uh, can be appropriated by different people. That was the long history. You have the long history. It's also related to the concept of Tian, that's the heaven, how to understand the the heaven in Chinese intellectual, not only intellectual history, but political history were there. And uh, um, the David question about the, uh, let's say that the uh, uh, 20th century China object of the thought of, uh, uh, the object of thought. I mean, uh, 20th century China as the object of thought means that uh, I try to uh, 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 reconstruct the dialogue relations with the 20th century because partly these were uh, 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 my challenge to the dominant historiographies in the contemporary uh, the period not only in China but also everywhere because you, you see that the the, the whole farewell revolution was dominant and of the end of the history was the, the dominant thesis here. So here the 20th century is the object for our judge, for our analysis as an object. But still, from my point of view, 20th century still have some potentials for thinking, I mean, as a resources for rethinking about the contemporary as the, the uh, Xiaonan's question, like a third worldism, it's not necessary to repeat what happened in a 20th century third worldism, but on the other hand, to promote the certain kind of the uh, solidarity, like uh, now the South-South dialogues and so on and so forth, but just, we can see that a certain kind of the continuation. And a lot of people still, we, uh, the, the last years, we had uh, several events on the Bandung conference, which uh, Bandung time the, as an event that already passed away. It's not possible to have another Bandung conference. But 
the Bannon conference can be thought as a, the, the object for thought. We, we had a dialogue to see from that perspective to think about the contemporary issues, as you mentioned, that the, 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 the dominant the nationalist, nationalistic sentiments so, and so on and so forth, even the revival of the racism. So when we can retrieve that tradition to think about the contemporary, as, as I said at the, earlier, uh, like a strategic thinking about the weakest link was also important for us, now we are in the age, in the, era, uh, the, the period of the coronavirus. All the, the supply chain and the production chain was uh, abrupt, uh, erupted. So what, where, where is the, uh, the, the, the real weakest link? How to find the forces is the way of thinking, I mean, the strategic thinking. Uh, that's why at the, by the end of the, my paper, I mentioned that the, the, the Chinese revolution uh, in different ways, like Lu Xun's resisted despair, or the starting from there, and the Mao, Maoism, the starting point was the, uh, the failure, was, was retreat, the great retreat, uh, setback of the revolution back to the countryside. And then, then they find the weakest link to transfer and the, the find the way to, to reshape the new political subjectivity. That I think it's also the lesson we can learn from there. So at that time, nobody can imagine that they will be successful. But everybody say now it's everything was gone. So in that sense, I, I think that's why revisit the 20th century China for me is still have some sense in contemporary Chinese context. I'm not sure whether or not it's in other area, but but these are, I I think it's the, the issue. And uh, uh, the Saido's uh, the Saido's issue of uh, the also I'm not so sure uh, whether or not I uh, really uh, grasp the, your question, but basically uh, you, you mentioned that the, the Chinese concept like the yin yang and so on and so forth, the dialectic, uh, the Chinese dialectics, I think it's uh, the way to rethink uh, about uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Chinese history. Not only I think it's uh, not only the, the Chinese history, but different histories. So in order to, if we are dissatisfied with the Eurocentrism, um, we can find a different ways uh, to rethink about the history and to find the ways for the dialogue, not only uh, as the early uh, uh, the, the questions about like a museum is all about the West or about China, but the really different traditions can be uh, retrieved as an object of thought to have a dialogue. That I think will be, I think that the huge transformation, uh, not only in the historiography, but also in a way of thinking. So the, the last week I had a conference together with some African scholars, Latin American scholars. The, 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 the topic was to see the different cosmologies to find the keywords from that different uh, cosmolo uh, cosmologies, uh, whether or not are uh, there any potentials for the contemporary thinking. So these are the one of the ways of thinking. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Wangwei. Uh, now we have round two, and uh, uh, what I'm suggesting is that uh, after round two and your response to it, we should close because I'm aware it's close to midnight in Beijing. <laughs> and I really don't want you to feel that we are taking advantage of you. Um, I mean, the advantage is ours. Yes, we are uh, getting a lot from this, but we want to be sure that you will say yes the next time we invite you. Um, you. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the next round, um, now, I received a number of comments on, on chat, and I have uh, advised uh, 
a couple of people that look. Um, limit your question to the talk and the text. Don't mm -hmm. feel free to ask any question about China. You, <laughs> we are not talking to a representative of the Chinese government. We are yeah. talking <laughs> with a scholar. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, so please. Um, so I hope people have take my advice. And but if you don't, I will feel free to intervene. Okay. Um, so no, no hard feelings. So the first uh, comment is coming from Gizal Wolde from Makerere Institute of Social Research, second year student. The second comment from uh, Tosin Orimolade, a fifth year student uh, working on the Nigerian state. Um, and uh, your third comment from Yosef Jemberi, also, uh, not fifth, fourth year student, both of them, fourth year student uh, working on Ethiopian society, philosophy, politics, many things. Um, so, Gizal, shall we begin? Yes, Professor, thank you very much. Uh, uh, and thank you, Professor, for, for your discussion. My question is very straightforward, but I, I think it is important. Uh, in the literature, uh, we, we, we read, we see uh, that there is a problem that China considers uh, to its internal stability, like um, uh, separatism. Uh, so you, you, you were mentioning in the lecture uh, the, a concept of uh, some, some, some concept of minority ruler. So what is the Chinese understanding of a minority? Mm -hmm. That's my question. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for a, a very rich uh, lecture. Uh, my, my, my question is a, a follow-up from a point uh, Professor Mahmoud uh, Mamdani raised earlier, which is how do you think how, how multiple temporalities can produce um, a single discourse or a single social formation. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know how you think about this. Uh, I, I think of two um, perhaps competing ways in which um, this has been taught um, of. Um, I think of, for instance, Tresky's idea of an even and combined development, where mm -hmm. seemingly commensurable ideas and practices combine to produce a single yeah. social order. Uh, and I yeah. think of Otsu's social formation, which is um, a product of the articulation of different instances, whether political, economic, and different spheres. So I'd like to know how, how you think about uh, how mo you can move from multiple temporalities to the single discourse, which is your, um, mm -hmm. your object. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And uh, Joseph, please. Um, my question is um, a methodological one. Uh, so I wanted to ask, what's the methodological lesson of uh, your approach to history? Um, what happens to traditional methodology of history? Uh, so both the traditional um, method of history and uh, uh, genealogy, basically use the diachronic approach. Firstly, it's a Gizzo's question of the, what is, how to understand and am I, how to define the minority. We know that the minority issue, the both the concept and the issue itself uh, became complicated and even the sensitive. Um, it's after, because once you define somebody as a minority, obviously the view was already started from the, uh, the majority or the from the state the structure and as well as so forth. That's the, uh, but on the other hand, we can see that uh, what happened, as I said, that the, in the 20th century minority, the concept of the minority was raised in a two 
this is the only, I think, the Chinese revolution, they mentioned that term of minority. Before that, uh, as the beginning of 20th century, for example, uh, the people didn't use that term as minority. They talk about the very concrete, uh, Mongolian, Tibetan, Uyghur, and so on and so forth, not as the term of minority. When the talk about the minority was really started from the so-called nationality policy, that policy was at the beginning, it was also controversial. But at the beginning, I think that uh, were the two levels. One is trying to reach the so-called the, 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 the equality between the nationalities. And the second was a co-development in the communist revolution. So that's the, uh, the why the, there was a minority policy. That was uh, the, the, the started from the, begin, uh, uh, the, the at the beginning. Like Zhou Enlai, for example, uh, Premier Zhou Enlai mentioned that uh, when the establishment of the autonomous regions, he, he argued that because most of the minorities in China in those regions were the economically speaking was backward. So that's why they want to integrate the great, the big uh, territory into the autonomous regime for the co developments at that time. But now it's, it's, a, it's a, that, that's, that's the, uh, the, the, the uh, in the 20th century. Now we also still continue to use this term, not that clear, uh, like uh, a political uh, the, the meaning. And uh, in the 20th century, the minority in China were thought as the oppressed nations. That's why the oppressed nations were the fight together with the proletariat. So that's what started from socialist idea of equality between the nationalities. This is the, the, the early base of, the, so this is a very different from now, the situation. You have found the continuation, but the, it's very different. So you, the nationality policy was also uh, very different uh, to some extent. Uh, is, uh, um, um, and uh, as I said, that the, like in the Qing dynasty, was still, uh, the, for example, how to define the Manchu. Manchu didn't define itself as a minority. Manchu is an elite, is a the ruling elite, not as a, uh, not as a, the minority. So the minority was, the, as a concept, that was only emerged in, in China. We call the Shaozhu Minzu, was only in the 20th century. That obviously that was in the framework of the the state, the the sovereign state, because for example the uh, the Muslim. Uh, you can find that in globally you have a lot of the Muslim, but these are majority or the minority. If you go beyond the boundary of the nation state, how to define it is totally different stories. So this is the, uh, the one of the issue. The second, or was the question multi multiple uh, templarity. And also the, you mentioned the, the Chosky's idea of combined development. I think this in this way was still uh, 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 important. I give you an example. You know, China had a great achievements for the like a reduction uh, uh, of the uh, of the poverty. You know, a lot of the the, uh, uh, the poverty was gone and. So now we are trying to argue that we are reached a certain level. Everybody became relatively rich. No, not really rich, but uh, basically get rid of the poverty uh, deduction, uh, reduction of the poverty was thought as a great achievement. But the standardization of the poverty line was unified, uh, universal. Uh, they use the economic standards to evaluate that, but not think about how to think about 
the natural environment, the social conditions, lifestyle, which cannot only be judged in terms of the economic standard, I mean, especially income, the money, to, to, to evaluate the quality of life, and so on and so forth, in different ways. Uh, I, I traveled, for example, in, in Tibetan areas. A, a lot of the young people who are want to reorganize them into a local community. They are even rethink about the collect collectivity, like a commune, for example. It's interesting because in, in other places, a lot of people are talking about the privatization of land or the, or the circulate, flexible circulation of land in order to, in order to fit into the so-called market economy. But they think about the certain kind of collectivity was very important to maintain the lifestyle. It's a kind of the cultural life. And it's not, it's not necessarily the backward. It's a kind of the multiple temporality in a synchro relations. In that sense, I think the uh, uh, Chosky argued that the combined development maybe still makes sense. We still can rethink about that concept. We, we can combine the combined development and a multiple temporality we can put together to think about the, the contemporary in, in, in the world. So what's the last question of called the methodology? Um, can you, but the first, first, the, the first part of the question already there, the, what we can learn from the European historiography, right? That's, it's a lot. It's a, we, we already learn a lot. It's a, not only the 19th century dominant narratives, but also the, a lot of the genealogy or, and so on and so forth. These are Karl Marx or Fox and Co. Uh, these were uh, a lot. And, but on the other hand, uh, we also see the limits of that, uh, the, the, the different ways of the history, the historiography. So that's why the people uh, thought that uh, we need to retrieve some uh, concepts or, or the methodology from our own tradition or the different traditions to think about the history is the possibilities. In this case, I mentioned that I have no time to elaborate. Zhang Taiyan already showed that uh, how can, he can do that the comparative history. He, he said that because his critique of the Edward Junks, the, the, uh, the history of politics, he basically, the first, he criticized that the, the linear history, the different social formation theory, and the second, he tried to compare patriarchal system different in the same term. But he, the first, he argued that the, the concept, the theoretical concept of patriarchal society was only based on European experience, cannot be naturally useful to analyze so-called the patriarchal system in China. Second, he argued that even within Europe, you have the different kind of patriarchal system. So that the theorization itself should be uh, uh, problematized and then rethink about this. So he tried to rethink about the singularity of the different historical experience and to find the way to compare with them. So that's uh, the, the his, that's why later he became he had a, some kind of uh, I'm not used a pluralistic uh, view, but try he um, certainly he argued for the singularity of different things in a different history and a different tradition. So if that's this is the, the his way we can still learn from him. He's a really a uh, very deep thinker. Um, Professor Wang Wei, unfortunately, Yusef cannot come uh, okay. back 
here. So, but I have one last question, which is from Ai Jung. Am I saying it correctly? Uh, Z H A N G. So, he or she says, um, as much as we could uncover and relearn alternative thoughts and genealogies, they still don't seem to have the same institutional and widespread power as the currently dominant worldview. Wondering what Professor Wang thinks of such inequality of different thoughts and what can be done about it. <laughs> this issue is, cannot be answered in, only in, in, in academic discourse. I mean, because the dominance of the of the certain knowledge was uh, was the result of the historical process is a real power relations. It's not only the knowledge relations. I mean, uh, these were Eurocentrism was come uh, became dominant. Uh, it's uh, the historically speaking was together with imperialism, colonialism, and so on and so forth. So in this is also the uh, what I try to rethink about that, the uh, the 20th century, uh, the, the 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 Chinese Revolution or the others uh, social movements. We can see that China was uh, relatively economically speaking was very backward still at that time, poor and not on the development. But but on the other hand like a third worldism, the idea of third worldism was so influential at that time for the solidarity of Asia, Af Africa, and Latin America. And not only as an idea, but as a way of organization of the social structure at that time, became quite powerful. So if you, if you read the like, uh, Wallace, Samia Amin, and uh, Ivan Ariki, and uh, those people, and also the uh, uh, Ray of Foucault, and so on, so on, they all, to some extent, learn something from that. So, in that sense, the, the, it's not only, uh, of course, we should, what we can do as a scholar, we try to think about this history, but on the other hand, the, 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 the strengths, and the, uh, was whether or not we can really develop the idea together with the real social struggle. That's, that's the lesson from the 20th century, I, I, the, the history. Thank you so much. Well, uh, I see we have 11 minutes to midnight. <laughs> Maybe we, okay. can we take this to midnight? In, if, if you yeah, agree. Joseph okay. is back. He can finish his question. <laughs> okay. Joseph, go ahead. Oh, Joseph, come, come back. Okay. Yeah. Great. Welcome. Yeah. My question on methodology is: um, um, What happens to traditional historiography and genealogy in the Foucauldian sense of history of the present? Uh, mm -hmm. If we follow your approach of uh, the, the synchronic approach instead of the diachronic approach. So is there still a room for the diachronic approach uh, in the kind of methodology that you, you assume? Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, uh, you can find a different ways to uh, write the history. In China, we have the very long and the very rich uh, the historical tradition. The, I mean, the, the historiography, historical studies. And uh, when I, at least, I don't know, I can uh, give you the answer in general, but what I can say that uh, I did some research on the historians in, in like uh, 18th century, for example, uh, Zhang Xuecheng, or the Dai Zhen, or the Zhang Taiyan, they all have developed the different ways to understand, to interpret the history, not only for the local history, 
but more general. They have background, they were still, they were able to, they still have a certain kind of the water view. Was really as, as and also they had the, 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 uh, the debates, not only in the level of the so-called facts or the certain events, the how to narrate the events, but also have a more philosophical methodological de debates there. Time issue, space issue, and all these issues were happened in that debate, but they developed a different concept of that. One of the concepts I use here uh, in my book was like a propensity of time. Like uh, these were the very different concept of time from, I mean, the, the, like uh, the European idea of time in different ways. I think the, uh, so we can find these and um, the, if we have reached uh, development, uh, more developments from like African history, Chinese history, Indian history, different histories to have a more dialogue, I think. It's not only dialogue, each of us not only dialogue with the center, so-called, but dialogue each other. I mean that the historical landscape was transformed. Thank you so much, Professor Wang Wei. Um, this has been a hugely, not only um, a learning process, but also an inspiration. Uh, and I think, uh, well, we will find out uh, the responses of our students, but uh, I have a sense that uh, you have convinced them uh, that learning is a lifelong process. Okay. Um, so uh, to everybody, uh, we are going to uh, have a, a longish break of probably several months in these global conversations, uh, partly because we are going on to uh, internal research reports within MISER for the next month, month and a half. And then we have our long vacation, which is from uh, September to December. But uh, we will be in touch with uh, everyone to announce our new calendar and our new schedule when the time is right. Uh, Professor Wang Wei, thank you so much. Thank again. you so much. Thank you all yeah. for your patience. And, uh, <laughs> no, no, for your, well, uh, <laughs> midnight, midnight, midnight in <laughs> Beijing uh, and uh, Noon time in New York and Kampala. And <laughs> um, everybody, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to close this now. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Oh, John.